It's really great to be here because we have something really important to talk about. I, my name is Heike, and I work for IBM Research. At IBM Research, we're working on something which is really amazing, quantum computers. I'm personally fascinated by the power and the beauty of quantum computers. I studied physics because I always want to know how things work. If something is happening, I want to understand why is it happening. So I brought this ball. And you all know what will happen if I drop this ball. If I open my hand, the ball will fall down and it will bounce a couple of times. We are all used to this behavior as we experience it every day in our life. It's, the behavior is based on the classical laws of physics. We can explain it by Newton's laws of motion. In our classical world, we can actually calculate accurately the location and the speed of physical objects. That's really great. However, after half a year of studying physics, I realized that there's actually many things we cannot calculate exactly. We cannot accurately solve. Things that might look quite simple are impossible to solve today. This I don't like. So take coffee. We all know what coffee is. And you see here the chemical structure of the molecule. It consists of a number of different atoms, like nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. It's a moderately sized molecule. It's larger than water, but much less complex than DNA. Let's assume we want to calculate the properties of this molecule exactly the internal energy spectrum, the internal molecular structure, the interactions, the reactivity of the molecule in order to understand how it stimulates our body. Just the complexity of this molecule is beyond our capability of being simulated with today's computers. Wow. We cannot exactly calculate the properties of this molecule. Why is this the case? Because this molecule is governed by the laws of quantum physics, not the classical physics. It has about 102 electrons, and all these electrons interact with each other. They influence each other's movement, and it's a so-called many-body problem which increases exponentially in complexity. With the computers we have available today, we can only calculate approximations of the exact equations of the structure. So we simply run out today of computing horsepower. So what can we do with computers today if we can't calculate these type of things? We can, of course, do a lot of great things, and you heard many of those already in the morning about the progress in AI. The progress we have been achieving in AI is directly connected to the progress of the compute power we have accomplished. Imagine you want to run your neural network algorithms on a Commodore in the, of the 80s or a laptop in the 90s. Of course, you wouldn't be able to do that. So today, we are able to do this, and compute power is directly important for this. So the AI was already known, actually, in the 80s. It's not a new thing. But we haven't had the horsepower to make it run. Today, we can. So actually, AI is made work because of three important key enablers. Algorithms, 
because over the last 10 years, there has been an enormous development of new machine learning algorithms, and you have heard some of in the morning of pattern recognition, image recognition, speech recognition, and others. On the other hand, second, data. The availability of the vast amount of data which we have today. There is exponential growth in availability of data. As, as one of the speakers mentioned before, thettabytes of data are available. And third, compute power. The cost and the performance of compute power which we have available today makes AI work. However, if we want to run on into the future, how can we guarantee also in the future that we have, have enough compute power available? Because the technology which we are using today, scaling is running out soon of horsepower, and we have to come up with something else. How will we be able to accurately solve problems, and how will we be able to have enough compute power available in the future? Imagine yourself 20 years ahead, and you look back to the computers we are using today. We actually just did this a second ago when we looked at the computers of the 80s and the 90s. So I'm incredibly excited to talk and to show you the new computers we are developing in our labs. For more than 30 years, we have been working and developing those computers, quantum computers. For a long time, they have been only existing in the realm of science fiction. But a lot of foundational research has enabled us to have now working quantum computers in our lab. Isn't it a beautiful picture? A beautiful computer? You see here the core of a quantum computer. At the bottom, where you see the canister, there is actually the quantum processor housed. And then you see lines coming down from the top to the bottom, which are going from the outside world, where the electrical measurement instruments are, to the quantum processor. These are microwave lines, because the quantum processor is controlled by microwave pulses. The, the states of such a quantum computer are very fragile. They're very delicate. They don't like heat. They don't like electromagnetic waves. Therefore, we have to cool down the quantum processors. They work at around 15 millikelvin. This is really super cold. It's about 100 times colder than outer space. And this is why this instrument is housed in a dilution refrigerator. So we keep the chip very cold. So let's move on to the next chart. Oh, here. Here you see actually the really heart of a quantum computer, the so-called quantum processor. We design and fabricate those chips at IBM. The technology which we are using is based on superconducting Josephson junctions. And you have two superconducting metals where you have an insulator in between, which, is the, which builds the quantum bit. And the qubit is actually housed in those squares, which you can see in the picture. And the lines in between are the microwave resonators, which control the state of the qubit. Here you see a 16 qubit chip, which we have built at IBM. So this is a radically different computer, because it's based on the laws of quantum physics. It's not just another different emerging technology. It's really a radically different computing paradigm. It's a true game changer. Why is this the case? Here, let's have a look how it, well, it's different to a classical computer. It's a game changer because we use qubits. You're all aware of bits which are used in classical computers. 
how you represent information in zeros and ones and use this to do your data processing. You can represent a state, like a bit, also in an arrow up or an arrow down. In a classical computer, you have only two states, zero or one. In analogy, in quantum computing, we have qubits. And a qubit can actually take on a one, arrow up, arrow down, actually, or a zero, arrow up, and a superposition of it. This means it can be a zero and a one at the same time. We call this phenomenon superposition of states. And it's illustrated on the right-hand side where you see the spheres. In classical computing, where you have the two bits, you can just represent the north pole or the south pole of the sphere. With the qubits, you can actually represent all the points on the surface of the sphere. And this is why we have a much richer possibility of storing information in qubits. We have a much richer dimensionality. So there's another very strange phenomenon which we are using in quantum physics for quantum computing. It's called entanglement. And I don't want to go into details. I bear you this. But keep in mind, if you entangle two objects, they are very closely related. And if you bring them far apart and you influence one of those objects, at the same time, you also influence the other one. And this strange behavior enables, actually, the scaling of the compute power exponentially. So this is what makes quantum computers really so powerful. It's the exponential scaling of the performance. So what does exponential really mean? Let's have a look at a story to explain what exponential scaling means. So this is a chessboard, and the inventor of the chess, he had this great invention, and he went to, this, to his emperor, and he gave the chess as a present. So the emperor was really excited, and he wanted to give in return any present he wanted to have the inventor. So what happened? The inventor, a really smart and intelligent guy, he brought forward the request that for each of those squares, he wanted to have a doubling of rice corns. This means you start at the field one with one rice corn. You go to the second field, you add, you double to two rice corns. You go to the third field, you again double to four rice grains. And this is how you increase the number of rice. It sounds like a very humble desire. So it starts on the first day with one rice corn. After a week, he had about 107 grains of rice, which is not really a lot. It's not even a meal. However, after a month, you already have, hopefully it comes, a really big pile of rice. So you have already 270,000 grains of rice. Um, and it's a hard time to even eat this in your lifetime. So let's continue. And you will see that after one month, you have a rice pile like a mountain. It's 461 billion metric tons. And this is actually 1,000 times more then we grow rice on the planet Earth within one year. So you see the power of exponentials. And the same way quantum computers are working, in the way that there is exponential power when we scale the number of qubits. So based on the phenomena of superposition and entanglement and the laws of quantum physics, the power of quantum computers scale like 2 to the power of n, where n are the number of qubits. This means adding one qubit doubled the performance of your computer. And here you see that we are applying this technology already. My colleagues are working on chemistry problems. 
and they have came up with a new approach to calculate the structure of molecules. They have demonstrated a calculation of beryllium hydride. It's still a small molecule, but it's the largest molecule which has ever been calculated by a quantum computer to date. It used only six qubits. For the caffeine molecule I mentioned at the beginning, we may need about more than 100 qubits, like 100 to 150 qubits. So quantum computing can really help to revolutionize material science and chemistry. So in this picture, you see actually one of the, a few of the working quantum computers we have in our labs. As I mentioned, they're housed in dilution refrigerators. And the rate of progress in that field is really enormously. We have started about two years ago with a quantum processor of five qubits, and today we have a quantum processor available with 20 qubits, and also one with 50 qubits, which we are currently having under test. So a question to you. When do you think you have a quantum processor available? When do you think you have access to it? Any guess? Perfect, almost right. Actually, two years ago. So two years ago, we have launched the quantum experience. So we have launched a five-qubit quantum processor via the IBM cloud to the public worldwide. So you can log in now, you can register, and use our quantum computer. About a year ago, we brought a 16-qubit processor online for you to use. And it's a really large and increasing community which we serve. We have about 85,000 of registered users in our quantum experience. We have more than 3 million of experiments which have been run on the quantum processor. And more than 70 papers have been published by the scientific community using our quantum processor. We are developing it further, the hardware, but also the entire software stack. You see here on the screen the infrastructure, the uh, um, kind of programming interface where you can sort out your algorithm and can let it run. So let's move on and really have a look again at this very beautiful computer we are building. It's available to you. You can use it. You can experience it. You can experience the laws of quantum physics because that's very different as the laws of classical physics, as I explained at the beginning. For classical physics, we have an intuition. For the quantum physics right now, we don't. We have to develop this intuition in order to become also very creative. And therefore, we make it publicly available also that you can log on, you can test it, you can test the laws of quantum physics, you can become creative with it. So in the next five years, there is a lot more to come. Uh, you can use it as professional developers, but also as you know, just interested um, people to learn about quantum, and you can create your intuition. We are at the start of the era of quantum computer, with the first quantum computer publicly available. And there is more to come. Look back in history how it was when in the 60s and 70s, the first computers became available. How did you learn to program it? How did you learn to use it? You opened your computer, you had the computer available, you had a programming language, and you started to learn. And this is what you can do today. Log on, use the programming language, and learn, and create and develop your intuition for quantum physics. It's truly a powerful computer, and it will revolutionize a lot of business and science. Thank you very much.